Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another webinar um, hosted by Solar Plaza. My name is Alfonso Barrenechea. I'm a project manager here. And today with two solar experts, we'll be discussing the evolution of challenges in solar asset opt optimization. Today with me, I have Anand Narayanan and VP of Asset Management at Aravon and Blaine Sondwell, Senior Director of Asset Optimization at EDF. Uh, before we get into the actual webinar, I'll do a, a quick rundown of how this session will look like. And I'll start with, with a quick introduction of who Solar Plaza is, what's our mission, and why we're doing this webinar. And after that, we'll have two brief presentations, first by Blaine, followed by Anand. And at the end, we'll be discussing and, of course, having a, a Q&A session with all of our participants. Uh, in case you do have a question, I suggest you don't save it for the end and type it into the question box as soon as you have it, as we expect to have a lot of questions at the end of the webinar. And we want to make sure that we're able to to reach uh, to answer your question in, in a timely manner. Um, yeah, so a little bit about Solar Plaza. So our goal is to positively impact the world by accelerating the sustainable energy transition. We were established in 2004. We're based in sunny Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And how we try to impact the world? Well, we try to you know produce resources such as webinars, newsletters, and of course our our main form of doing this is hosting conferences or. or type of events like summits. We've done over 170 events in over 43 con countries and our network of solar professionals is that of around 60,000 individuals. Um, aside from our event, we actually uh, opened the uh, launched last year, sorry, the Solar Plaza Consultancy. This is for anyone who's interested in a bit more, you know, detailed matchmaking, uh, market intelligence or different reporting. Uh, feel free to contact us or go to solarplazaconsultancy.com and to find out a bit more about this in detail. Um, for this uh, specific webinar, of course, we'll be focusing on the, on the U.S. market. Why? Well, this is on the run-up to our conference, the Solar Plaza Summit Asset Management North America. It'll take place the 6th and 7th of April uh, in Oakland, California, so that's just a couple of weeks away. This will be the eighth edition of our conference where we focus on the operational phase as well as anything asset management related. Uh, this year, even though it's a two-year conference, we actually have like a pre-conference day uh, where we, we will be focusing on, on seminars as well as a networking evening. The networking evening is actually um, for, for charity. It'll be a fundraiser for a foundation that works with solar energy um, in, in Oakland. So for anyone who's interested, uh, I strongly recommend you check it out and try to book a, a spot for it as we, are trying, we, are, we will run out of um, spots for the event. I mean, in case you have not gotten your ticket, uh, this is a good chance to do so. If you use the code webinar-10, you'll actually get a 10% discount on the full ticket. Um, so it's a pretty good opportunity for those, you know, late birds that still want to join us in California. Feel free to do so. Um, from my side, then, a practical note to make sure you guys get to enjoy the, the webinar to the max. I mean, if you have any questions, as I mentioned, you know, you want to ask our, our participants, feel free to use a question box. This is on the side of your panel. We will be able to answer them after the presentations. And again, I encourage everyone to try to send their questions as soon as they have it, as opposed to waiting for the Q&A part of the session. If you have any technical issues, also use the question box. Uh, I have a colleague here with me who will try to make sure that we fix this as soon as possible so that you can enjoy the webinar. And of course, the presentation slides and full recordings will be made available. They will be sent to your email, and you can also find them on YouTube on our Solar Plaza channel. This normally takes one or two days uh, for us to process these. Um, yeah, now to get a bit into our speakers, we have Anand Narayanan, as I mentioned, Vice President of Asset Management at Aravon. He has over 10 years of experience in the solar O&M space, deep knowledge of market drivers and technology improvements. He previously worked at First Solar Energy Services, both as a performance engineer and technical sales, and he hosts a master's in electrical engineering, energy and power systems. Our second speaker, and the first one to, to present today, is Blaine Sundwell, Senior Director, Asset Optimization at EDF. He joined EDF in 2013, and he's responsible for over 1.6 gigawatts of generating assets, inside of those, one gigawatt of solar. He specialized in asset optimization and operations. He previously worked at Iberdrola Renewables and predecessors for the last 14 years. Invol he's normally involved in their initial startup in solar O&M, asset management, finance, PPAs, and trading. Blaine, with this, I'd like to give the floor to you so you can begin your, your presentation. Take it away, Blaine. Yeah, thank you, Alfonso. Um, and I'd like to wish everyone a happy Ides of March. I'm um, looking forward to a, a good webinar today. I thought I'd start out with a to kind of baseline uh, the discussion. Asset management is a term that's used in a lot of different contexts. So thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about what that means, uh, 
particularly for what we do in renewable energy. It's not the asset manager type that you might find at a bank or someone who's necessarily uh, boots on the ground, even though the term is used uh, that way uh, at times. So uh, next slide. So I put up uh, kind of the standard definition for asset management. It's from the ISO 55,000 definition. I'm not going to read this to you, uh, but I think uh, the self, the first uh, item is self-evident. Uh, it's about realizing value from the asset. But what I want to highlight is the note, uh, the second uh, paragraph there, and concentrate on the balancing, the balancing of risk opportunities, costs, and performance. And that's really what uh, the role of the asset manager is. So next slide. So an excellent book on um, the topic of um, project finance is by a fellow, I, I think he's Italian, Stefano Gatti. Uh, he wrote a book um, and he had a good definition, in my opinion, of what the role of the asset manager is, and it's managing the web of contracts related to the structured financing of a project. It's a bit from his perspective, but I think it's very close. It's a good book. He's got a course on Coursera that's free if you want to watch it, uh, but it really kind of uh, gives a big broad view of, of the role of the asset manager and the web of the contracts, which, uh, next slide. So the asset manager sits in the middle. I like to tell my team, uh, you know, we're not the biggest part of the wheel. We're not the outside of the spokes, but we sort of sit in the hub of the wheel. Uh, managing the special purpose vehicle in the US, it's the LLC, and integrating all of the different aspects of the project, predominantly after COD, but uh, very much get involved earlier on to ensure that you get a uh, good project. And so it's pretty easy to see all of the, the, the different pieces. You've got investors, uh, and that can be in a, a bunch of different flavors. The more asset management you do, the more investor types you're going to meet. Uh, you've got your revenue, got to get paid. If you don't get paid, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not doing your job. And there's a, a whole series of different payments that are associated with that. I think sometimes Folks just think, hey, I put some megawatt hours out on the grid and I get some money from the utility. Um, that is getting more and more complex as time goes by. There's a lot of different pieces to it. Uh, even each of the bullets there break down uh, generally into, into uh, separate sets. How do we do it? We, we use our advisors. Uh, the asset manager really can't be an expert in every area. I will admit when I'm hiring, it's very difficult to find an asset manager who has done asset management before. If you can, that's ideal. If not, uh, I like to find somebody who has a very strong background in one of the areas and then um, a, a real ability and a love for learning because you have to, you have to learn something new pretty much every day. Now you're operational in the lower right, O&M agreements, LGIA, things of that nature. Uh, that takes a lot of time, it's very important. Um, and then the supply contracts, of course, and then regulatory. And regulatory gets more complex as well uh, as we go through time. So it's a, it's a big integration and balancing effort for the asset manager. And each of those areas that are in a, a particular segment might not get that you've got uh, the other pieces. For instance, your, your O&M folks might not understand that you can't just right away invest a million dollars that maybe you need to talk to uh, an equity investor and, and get their consent, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so I'll go to my last slide and just kind of give an example of what an asset manager needs to know. I have a standard list of uh, asset manager questions. So uh, this is a, a cheat sheet for anyone who might be coming to interview uh, with me. Um, and I'll leave it here. It's, it'll be in the recording, but uh, 
my team and I have kind of uh, come up with, you know, if someone says, well, what do, what do you do? Um, you know, you're talking to your mom or your uncle and, uh, you know, we try to break it down into four broad areas, finance, regulatory operations and contracts. I make some nice uh, um, frock, F-R-O-C, easy to remember. But it's a very wide and broad, it's a broad range of different topics that an asset manager needs to know and uh, needs to be able to speak intelligently to and to know when to pull in uh, advisors and experts and how and weave them all together uh, to get to a solution for whatever the problem is for the day. So I'll turn it back to you, Alfonso. Great, Blaine. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for you know setting the the stage for what an asset manager is and what he actually does. Um, Anand, I'd like you to to take the floor now, and and you you know you'll do your short presentation. After that, we'll dive into the discussion part. Anand, the, the yeah. floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you so much, Alfonso, and uh, thanks Solar Plaza for for the opportunity. Uh, Blaine, first of all, again, thanks for setting the stage. Uh, I will say I'll probably fail all the questions which you mentioned as as uh, the list of uh, questions for an interviewee. But, uh, but again, uh, needless to say, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to Solar Plaza and, uh, and thanks, Blaine, for, for setting this up. Um, what I wanted to do was um, kind of set the stage in terms of what Arivon is and, and um, how we've uh, kind of come into, uh, come into fruition at this point in time. Uh, so moving to the next slide, um, uh, prior to 2021, um, we were uh, Capital Dynamics uh, and uh, CD Arivon uh, was, uh, was an, was an uh, Asset, Arivon was more of an asset management affiliate of Capital Dynamics uh, of the Clean Energy Infrastructure Fund, trying to manage uh, a portfolio of private uh, private equity funds. In 2021, there was this opportunity to kind of, uh, for the investors, the three big investors that we had, uh, to kind of create uh, a single entity which had the expertise of uh, the investment professionals as well as the asset management capabilities that uh, that we had built uh, in in Scottsdale, Arizona, and so um, what those what those three asset uh, what those three investors kind of did was create this single entity called Revon Energy, uh, now which houses a majority of the assets uh, that uh, Revon had managed previously, and so um, Revon provides commercial financial performance um, as well as construction and development management services for um, for our entire fleet at this point in time. So we have close to 10 gigawatts of projects in our uh, in our fleet, and uh, um, I think what we try to bring in is all the institutional investing as well as operational know-how that uh, that has helped us grow this platform, right? Um, with, as, with obviously with acquisitions early on, and then now with uh, with significant organic development that uh, that we're focused on. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we currently manage uh, on the asset management side. We currently manage close to six gigawatts. Um, it's a mix of solar storage as well as uh, wind projects. Uh, we have 500 megawatts of storage, 500 megawatts of wind, um, and the remaining of it is, is all solar spread across the entire nation at this point in time. Uh, moving to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> again, one of the key, key elements of us having created an, an asset management platform, when we started early on um, in like 27, in end of 2017, early 18, uh, the focus was on finance and accounting as well as asset management and operations. And as we've kind of expanded our platform and, and grown uh, in leaps and bounds, we've added various different functionalities to support what has been now become um, a massive organization with diverse capabilities, uh, with, uh, uh, with focus on how do we optimize the performance of the asset, be it during the operational phase as well as early on during the development, construction, and sometimes even in the origination phase, right? So, so procurement uh, is now a key aspect of what we do, government affairs, given all the activities that we see um, in the world at this point in time, um, and obviously development construction, right? And so what all this has kind of given us is an ability to scale uh, really well and look after assets in the best possible fashion, right? And so um, if you can go on to the next slide, um, one thing that I will mention is we, we manage close to 4, 000, more, more than 5,000 contracts at this point in time, 500 plus bank accounts, right? Uh, and the, the concept has always been with an owner's mindset. And again, as, as, we, trans, as we become uh, a full-fledged IPP, uh, the idea is always to um, 
have and manage assets that are uh, risk managed the best out there, right? Uh, and to do this, what we what we have are trusted partners, right? Um, we we don't do everything in house, right? And 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 the and the idea is that we use um, partnerships and relationships to kind of help us manage that, be it on the O&M side, be it on the EPC side, um, and be it even on the procurement side. And so, um, what we try to kind of bring bring forward is an innovative uh, solution set, right? That is um, that is that is pushing us towards uh, the renewable energy transition. Um, I would like to say that we are we are there, but I mean, obviously, uh, in terms of um, uh, the overall reach that I think we all need to kind of achieve towards uh, and 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 meet, uh, I think we're still far away, just given uh, all the climate goals that I think we need to uh, push ourselves towards, right? Um, so what do we do in terms of trying to kind of move towards that um, is uh, provide innovative offerings, right? Um, be it during um, the origination phase, be it during the financing phase, be it during development construction or during operations, right? And so, how do you achieve all this? We use high tech, and then we use high touch, right? Um, like I like I mentioned, uh, one of our key areas that that we like to um, keep our minds focused on is um, making sure that we have trusted partnerships and relationships, and as to how ultimately we manage these assets, right? Um, and like and Blaine kind of mentioned various different topics of asset management that um, that is that is critical to an asset manager. Um, I mean, the way I try to represent it to my team is uh, we're focused primarily first on relationships. Next aspect is risk, and then the third aspect is contracts. Although I say contracts is the last one, it's uh, the relationship and the risk aspect ultimately kind of boils down to how you manage your contract and. Um, that that web of contracts that um, that Blaine had mentioned is so true in terms of being able to manage um, all those all those critical aspects in a particular contract, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as um, as this uh, webinar uh, progresses. So, um, I think that was the end of my slides. Um, and so, Alfonso, if that is uh, kind of pointed back to you at this point. Great, thanks for that, Anand. And then Blaine, I'd also invite you to you know to turn on your webcam again. And we can um, begin the the discussion, you know, on the the evolution of asset management. And um, I think a a good place to start. I think you guys already defined pretty clearly what is asset management. But now zooming in on the solar part, you know, maybe we can start with saying where asset management was, uh, you know, four or five years ago, where it is today, and where we see it uh, moving forward. Um, Anand, if I can start with you, what are what are your thoughts on this? You've been in the industry for a while. Have you seen this evolve? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the key aspects that I think. Just from a revenue management perspective, and again, I think uh, again, I'll I'll keep referencing back to Blaine, right? I mean, being able to kind of manage your revenue is probably the 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 uh, the most key element, right? That that we're all focused on. Um, those revenue contracts have changed drastically, right? Across across five years, um, gone. I mean, obviously, when we started five years ago, well, ten years ago, right? I mean, bus bar PPAs that was kind of the norm, uh, fairly easy to manage because I mean, the numbers were all. Uh, we're easy to understand, right? For the most part, um, and then came in the concept of hedges, and then now we have uh, hedges plus uh, bus bar PPAs, and now we have multiple different optic uh, situations as well. And then now with the onset of solar plus storage, you you uh, you have the situation where you have to manage various different ancillary services as well as revenue stack concepts, kind of coming from um, various different sources, right? So. Being able to manage that, I think, has um, has obviously changed, right? And has become more. Um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of touch, right, from that perspective, in trying to make sure that you know where every single uh, uh, electron is moving at this point in time, right? And and being able to kind of quantify that. Um, so yeah, so contracts have become have become difficult, right? Um, uh, just managing all that uh, is is in itself. Uh, quite a bit of work. Um, another aspect which I'll mention is um, five years ago we had projects that were all fully developed, fully uh, EPC, the development agreement, the O&M agreement was all wrapped, right? Um, that has changed, right, across the last five years. And now we have uh, now owners do self procurement, right? Um, we do as well. Uh, there are different contractors that come into picture. Uh, and so managing those different contractors, each contractor has a warranty. So managing all those different warranties has does take up significant more time. 
uh, from that standpoint. And that I think has just evolved over time and time and become slightly more difficult compared to what, what it was five years ago. Um, and then probably the last one which I'll mention um, is NAT cat risk, right? I mean, natural catastrophe risk has just gone up significantly. And so uh, trying to try to make sure that you have plans put in place for that to the best extent possible, right? And that goes well into construction and development, right? Early on in the phase, be it identifying your land, be it the kind of files that you use uh, to creating fire breaks and systems that you want to, right? Um, all that needs to kind of come into play very early on now, rather than you are you having to kind of wait and sit back and uh, wait until you get the asset into the operations phase, right? So those probably I think would be my like key aspects which I've seen like majorly change right across the last five years specifically. Yeah, and I, I think I'll pick up where uh, Anand left off with, uh, and then move on to other topics. But with the uh, natural disaster risk, I think you're seeing more involvement by regulators in that area, right? We get a lot of requests for information. If even a minor wobble on the grid that was caused by the grid, uh, you'll see the regulators say, well, I want to know everything that happened at your plant when I dropped the line. <laughs> and you're like, well, wait, you dropped the line. Um, that's why my plant went offline. But you're, you know, you're, you spend a, a few weeks gathering a lot of uh, minute data. I think another thing that's happened is um, we're, uh, we've been very successful. So there's a lot of new plants. And you see a lot of new plants in a single area because, you know, that's where the transmission and the solar is. And so you start to see congestion uh, where before you'd have a large, wind, uh, rather large solar plant all by itself. And now you go and it's a glass ocean. And um, there's, that's not something that we saw that we, we were certainly seeing that five years ago in the wind industry, but it's becoming a larger issue uh, in the solar industry. Uh, and I, then I think the other thing in the energy industry since it started um, more than 100 years ago has kind of been a, a boom. I don't to say bust, but, it, you know, you had a boom time and then you had less activity. And I think we're in a boom cycle right now. You've got a lot of new money that's coming into solar. Um, you know, it's the there's the search for yield on investments. And so uh, before, you know, an asset manager was talking to a fairly sophisticated uh, investor who had maybe 10, 15, 20 other projects in their portfolio, you may be dealing with someone where this was their first one. And so you need to you need to help them along with understanding the knowledge and the risk. Um, you know, one month of uh, low performance because you had clouds doesn't mean that their 25 year investment is you can't extrapolate that for the rest of time. So I think you're seeing that and, and also with the growth. And I think we're going to talk about it later is you have uh, you have issues with staffing because, um, you know, it's uh, there's a lot of demand for that. Uh, and the staffing, and I'm, I won't talk to about it too much because I know we're going to cover it in a bit, but um, it's a lot more electronics than in, you know, the uh, wind renewables. So in that area, you, you had both electronics and mechanical, but I think with the solar, um, you know, most of the complexity is in the electronics. Great, thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks the two of you for for that. And I think this is actually a a good uh, chance to to launch our, our first poll and see what our, our audience says. Basically, the question is: um, uh, Has the quality of assets improved or gone down in the last five years? And the reason I think it's it's relevant to to ask it right now, and I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts uh, before all the attendees get to answer, is um, what you were mentioning, Blaine. You know, new new investors, a, a lot of new money, so way more plants are being built. You know, on one side, of course. You, you, the two of you already mentioned how the asset manager is now in charge of procurement or oversees the EPC phase and how that relates to an operational success. Um, what are your thoughts? You know, you guys have seen uh, plenty of plants in the in the last five years. It's they're way more complex, way more digitalized. I imagine the regulations for them 
are way higher as well. Uh, would you consider that the quality of assets that you have to manage now has improved or, or deteriorated? And I'm curious as well, what are your thoughts? Do you think the audience will consider them improved or, or deteriorated as well? What do you think, Anand? All right, I could, I, I, I could, take, I could go first. Um, um, it, my, my opinion, and I think a lot of the um, uh, attendees will, will probably agree as well, is that the quality of assets have deteriorated, um, have have gone down uh, for sure. Um, <clears throat> and again, right, it's it's a it's a very funny conundrum, and I was trying to kind of think through this a little bit more uh, last night. Um, well, like I said, right, I mean. Five years ago, ten years ago, we had all these full wrap contracts, right? And that were that were uh, that were there for us. Quality of asset was uh, was great. I mean, um, not too much of land constraint situations that we were in, and so uh, we knew for a fact that uh, there wouldn't be any sort of row to row shading or the kind of equipment that would get installed would be would be high quality, um, so on and so forth. Um, <clears> or <throat> and all the procurement. Uh, was all done by a single contractor, single person, be it the inverters, modules, trackers, right? Transformers, everything was kind of wrapped, and you had a you had a solid O and M wrap as well on it, right? Back then, um, obviously that's that's not there in the market anymore, right? Uh, it's it's extremely extremely rare to find, um, and owners have become and and obviously there was a premium charge for it, right? Uh, for 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 good reason. Um, now obviously. All of us are aware that, that I mean that premium, the risk of solar is not that high, and so uh, people have understood that we could probably self procure certain services, certain equipment, uh, and so there's been there's been a divide and conquer kind of a situation occurring right in this, uh, and what that has probably led to is hey you know what there is a small portion that somebody is responsible for, but the interplay between that and another portion that a different contract is responsible for. So, uh, the, I mean, this, there's this saying, the one throat to choke, right? I mean, uh, for uh, as much as I try to kind of avoid using it, I mean, it's a, it's a very commonly used term that, that, uh, that, is, getting, that is getting thrown out in the industry. Um, obviously, that's gone. Um, and so the situation where, yes, uh, for us as owners, I mean, we see the opportunity to have more control over certain um, uh, procurement decisions, over certain service decisions that we can make, right? By by performing some of it in house or by contracting it separately in in chunks. Uh, but what that has also kind of created or caused is the situation of excess warranty management, um, <clears throat> not having a fully bound, a fully wrapped um, uh, project, right? Per se, uh, and so I think that has definitely caused. And again, prices, right? I mean, everybody is uh, is cost challenged and is uh, um, uh, trying to kind of make uh, uh, pennies, right? At this point in time, right? And so it's become a challenging environment to kind of be in. And I think that's what that's led to is um, <clears throat> some amount of um, cost optimization, if I if I can call it, uh, if that's the right terminology, to kind of use in 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 coming up and creating some of these plants. Um, and again, some 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 of these some of the technologies which have been created are actually really good. I mean, it's it's fascinating to see uh, what uh, what some of the, what some of these solutions have created for us, right? Uh, because it's it's helped reduce time immensely, right? In terms of construction or even in terms of operational services. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you've seen um, certain elements of being able to isolate equipment kind of go away, right? So like, like let's say a transformer and inverter were to fail the medium voltage side, being able to isolate them, right? And so bringing back the remainder of the plant back online, um, those have all kind of, uh, I mean, gone away to some extent. Um, and again, that's what we as owners now try to kind of enforce and make sure that that these do still happen, right? Uh, and and what, what additional add-ons do we need? Uh, from suppliers, I think becomes critical, and and for us to kind of manage it with a more uh, keen uh, sense, uh, uh, keen sense, right, from that standpoint. So um, that would be my that would be my answer. I, I kind of feel that definitely assets have de deteriorated, um, but at the same time, uh, it is there are certain things which have certain new technologies which have come up which have helped um, optimize the construction and the operational process. From that standpoint, sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but 
explain. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I agree with um, most of that. I think, you know, EDF was an early adopter of the uh, self-perform and self-procurement of things and, and really never did the full wrap. Um, and then because we're, you know, developer and then operator. I do think, though, you're right, the... You know, the overall environment has deteriorated. Um, a lot of that is the cost constraints, right? I mean, before you had a little bit more room to move. If you had a problem, there was more money in the deal and you could, uh, it gave you some maneuvering room. And now it's, it's very tight, um, which means timelines are tight. Um, you know, we were developing projects um and bidding them into rfps with you know not sure if the panels were going to be there right and so you you a lot of these things are moving in parallel the the time frame for a project has shortened dramatically which means you have a lot of things in flight at, at the same time and if if one of them wobbles it becomes uh an enormous problem i think there i, I also agree that there are segments that are much improved the optimization. Uh, I think some of the things that they're doing with trackers and the digitization around that is pretty interesting and exciting. Um, but I think um, there's a huge rise in complexity that the asset manager has to deal with. And uh, it, I think the other challenge that I see is because so many folks came over from wind there was this, you know, there were the ratios, right? You have one technician for every turbines and then, you know, boom, 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 and so many asset managers. And so then you look and you say, okay, well, we have far fewer people at solar. That means that the asset manager can manage a whole bunch more of those. But you saw the, you know, you saw the same number of per project, you have the same number of substation investors and regulatory issues. And so I, I, I see a, a lot of my team are just buried in a lot of uh, a lot of particularly the regulatory and, and granted I've got a lot of uh, facilities in California and uh, the ones outside of California don't see as much of that but uh, California's um, is challenged because as uh, Anand mentioned earlier the natural disasters have caused everybody to be very jumpy about things and so Kaiso is very involved with everybody. Um, and not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. I think it's good. I think in, in one respect, that's brought more rigor to the project um, construction and development. And uh, in, in that segment, there's an improvement. But overall, I'd say, you know, if you were to, on balance, it's deteriorated, although there are segments that have improved. Interesting. Then th thanks for, for the answer to the two of you. Um, let's showcase the, the results. Um, I think quite a, a different reaction from, from our audience. <laughs> but I think uh, the, the two of you alluded to, to the same kind of answer that maybe the, in, the quality of, of the asset has deteriorated, but the technology and the tools used as an asset manager to, to monitor, to investigate, to, you know, to monetize the asset have uh, improved, which is kind of the, the goal of this webinar, right? To, to define how the role of the asset manager changes uh, Blaine, I think you already spoke a bit about, um, you know, digi the dig digitalization, how these tools are helping. Um, yeah, where do you see this this trend going, right? I think uh, a couple of years ago, the, the, the big part was, uh, you know, drones and how this completely changes how you can uh, look at plants. What would you see then, I guess, asset management software where you can aggregate everything? Then some argue, you know, that got a bit too complex and it's time to re-simplify it. And this is kind of this back and forth with digital tools. What are your thoughts for for the future in terms of digitalization? You know, as an as an asset manager or asset optimizer, you know, what would be your your ideal uh, future, and where do you think it's actually heading? Nan, do you mind if I go first? Go ahead, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I think that the, it's it's quite interesting. You know, I started um, in the industry in the power industry a long time ago, um, um, in the late '80s, if you can believe it, and the plants that I was at data was taken by hand you put it into logs right and then you move fat and, and it was all solid state equipment there were there weren't even plcs and you know as time went best there were plcs and I thought boy it really would be cool if we could get the data out of this into some 
tools so the business could use it. And then that started to happen. And then boom, it went from, man, I wish I could get some data to what am I going to do with all of this data, right? There's just an, it's just a huge uh, deluge of information. And so I think one of the biggest challenges for uh, digitalization is um, curating that data, sorting the wheat from the chaff, making sure that the data that you're looking at is the data that you need, and not something that's similar in your database that's giving you a different and wrong answer. And so I think it's it's a mad rush to stay ahead of the ocean of data and uh, to get it in a format that's usable uh, without, you know, basically hiring Intel and Amazon and Microsoft's entire companies to come in and sort it out for you. I think a, a lot of folks might not realize it, but the 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 data folks will. Is there are typically in a, a good sized company, the digital data that's coming in, there's millions of data points, literally millions of them. And um, when you were like, I did combined cycle, you would loop check each piece of data that came into your DCS, right? That means a loop check, someone goes out into the field, they operate the transducer and you watch it through the data on the screen and out. You can't do that if you're building a project that has 200,000 points. You would never finish before the end of the project, <laughs> right? And before, I mean, the entire project life, it would take you over 20 years to get done with that. And so that's a huge challenge. And I really feel for the folks who are trying to manage it. Anand, what do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a great point. And uh, I mean, Blaine tried to date himself a little bit over there, but I mean, Blaine's up to date with everything which is going on in the industry right now. So uh, the, the fact is that um, <clears throat> there is a lot of digitalization, right? No, no question about it. Every, every asset manager, every owner is focused on um, making sure that they have a single platform that they use, don't want to use different SCADA systems, don't want to use different portals to kind of jump into, right, and monitor assets or control assets, right, because it's not sustainable, uh, right? I mean, at, uh, at, at the rate at which we're growing and then at the prices at which I think things are, right? Um, it's funny, I mean, when, uh, when, when Blaine was talking about that, I tried to just, did, just go down memory lane and think about how, when I started out as a performance engineer, I was like managing, I think the largest asset which I was managing was like an 80 megawatt site at that point in time. Uh, but again, <clears throat> uh, not too many data points, like a 13 megawatt site, which I remember really well, 20 megawatt site, which I remember really well, um, had significant amount of data points. And we were slowly but surely starting to figure out, oh, you know what, how is this going to work for a 200 megawatt site, right? Back then. Uh, 200 megawatt site is like the norm these days, right? Um, and Sure, like, I mean, Blaine will talk about, hey, I mean, I'd rather have a 200 megawatt site than a, than a 10 megawatt site because uh, small sites, big problem, big sites, big problems. It's all the same, right, at the end of the day, right? Um, um, but the fact is that when we went from, like, fixed tilt to trackers, it just multiplied the data qu uh, data quantity, uh, in, in like, immediately, right? I mean, in, in like, 2x, 3x, uh, almost in terms of data points that we're starting to look at. Do we need do we did we need to look at all those data points at that point in time? Probably not, right? But I think we've learned over time and I think we've we've reduced that. Now with the onset of, of storage, oh everybody wants to see cell level data, right? Uh, and just imagine having cell level uh, information coming out from the battery packs, because again, you need to manage that for warranty purposes, right? Trying to kind of see if that is genuinely the case, right? Again massive, massive amount of data that we're trying to manage. So what would become key at this point in time, apart from the metrics that, that we all create, which again, I think we have, gr we have grown in leaps and bounds on that, right? And I think uh, the industry continues to do a great job, right? In terms of like talking about which metrics to kind of talk about um, and which metrics to use and quantify and whatnot uh, to kind of show value. But the quality of data, right, and making sure that the data is valid for you to kind of come up with a good result for your particular plant or know what how your plant is performing has become uh, an absolute mess, right? And there are very few providers out in the market that are trying to make sure that that is the case, right? And again, in a growing solar, growing fleet as such, right? I mean, trying to manage that is uh, is a challenge, I feel. And so, um, <clears throat> Apart from having 
awesome tools to kind of tell you how your project performs. I think having those tools also tell you, yes, you know what, this particular performance index or this particular availability metric is has um, has a has a rating in terms of quality of data associated with it. I think is key, right, for us to know that. Okay, you know what. When we are presenting, when Blair and I are presenting to the investors, or our teams are presenting to the investors, or to the owners, right? As such, knowing for a fact that we can present those data accurately, I think has become become important. And right, I mean, and Blair will agree to this, right? The asset managers can't look at every single data point and make sure that those are accurate, right? We are looking at key key metrics that kind of help us, right? Revenue variance, uh, resource variance, right? Performance index, availability. Those are the kind of things that I think we're more focused on. And, and there's a ton of data points that actually feed that, right? So making sure that that is accurate. And now you have 200, 300 megawatt sites, right? I mean, how do you know a weather station sitting in one location is, is accurate as one other one sitting in, in your north, southeast corner versus northwest corner, right? I mean, there's all sorts of data that you kind of need to manage from that standpoint. And so it is a challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge which a lot of providers have taken, taken up, right? And have... I would say have done actually well, right? And because that is what has helped a lot of owners manage their data well. But the challenge always keeps getting complicated, right? As you can expect uh, with the onset of solar plus storage, tracker systems, trackers tracking now, right? Or um, uh, the um, smart tracking algorithms, which are all being created. Um, there's like various different aspects that I think we are all we are looking for. The invert, yeah, this is another good example. The inverter is now being modularized, right? And so initially you just got like 10 different data points from a single inverter. Now you get 10 different data points from each module of the inverter, right? Because you need to kind of see how, how each inverter module performs. Um, so it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, and very challenging situation to kind of be in. Uh, and I always laugh about this because um, I was on the receiving end uh, previously when I was a performance engineer trying to manage the quality of data and make sure that all the data is filled in and you had 1440 data points per day uh, for every single data tag, right? Um, uh, but now like we are in the situation where like that is just escalated exponentially, right? Um, but yeah, all things said and done, digitalization is there, it's gonna continue. People are gonna kind of continue doing cool stuff. Uh, all the Python whiz, whiz kids, uh, which there are out there right right now, uh, I think will um, uh, are always excited to create automatic automated tools and automation tools, right, uh, to kind of help us out from that situation. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting situation to kind of be in. So. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. And, and with any, like any technology curve, I imagine, you know, as, as more progress is done, more challenges are found and then more people totally. are found to, to solve the challenge. And speaking on, on people found to finding people to, to solve challenges, I blame you had already briefly alluded to it in terms of, of staffing and how this is kind of a, a problem of, of the future asset managers. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit more about that? You know, how does staffing affect your, your asset management team? Yeah, and I think it ties out with uh, what I was saying in my brief presentation when you've got such a broad range of topics that an asset manager needs to engage on. Um, it, it's very it's very difficult to find somebody who is very good in each of the different areas. And so for me, I try to build a team of uh, folks who have different backgrounds. And so um, maybe you've got someone who doesn't want to be an engineer anymore, but they were an engineer and now they want to learn more of the commercial aspect and they want to deal with contracts. But you can go back to that engineering knowledge when uh, they're your, an asset manager or uh, maybe somebody was in accounting. And, you know, some folks like to do accounting their entire career. Other folks, you know, they do it for 10 years and they say, OK, now what have I been accounting? Oh, there's a project associated with those numbers, and that's pretty cool too. And so, it's it's a um, again with the puzzle pieces, right? If you're building a team, and Arnon Ar Ar mentioned this when he was talking about his strategic partners, right? Um, I think Alan Watts said nobody's mouth is big enough to say the whole thing. You need to build that balance when you're managing a team. You build it within your team. You build it within your subcontractors. You build it with all your partners, and um, and it's tough. It's tough to find it. Um, the it's a it's a in a world where specialization 
has become uh, kind of the big thing, it's tough to find generalists, right? To find the generalist that can go from an O and M meeting, and that, and then the, in the next uh, meeting over, they're talking about the markets or hedges. That's tough. It's tough yeah. to find the, that expertise. Yeah. Your your thoughts on that, Anand, on, yeah, on finding. Totally true, right? I mean, we're all trying to find jack of all trades, right? As an asset manager, you've got to be one. Uh, it's uh, it's you need a diverse skill set, right? And uh, somebody who's ready to learn, like 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 Blaine mentioned, right? Somebody with an accounting background who's ready to know what availability means, right? And how what what how does lost energy get calculated, right? Going into that, um, having that is is. Uh, is, is hard, right? And uh, like I said, right, I mean, jumping from a meeting where you're talking about revenues and hedges and then you're moving into another meeting with an o &M provider, definitely a challenge, right? Uh, no question whatsoever. And imagine, right, I mean, imagine the quantity of contracts that you're managing, right? Is um, <clears throat> it, 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 uh, um, the, the concept of like being able to talk to an o &M manager, right, an o &M provider, uh, and discuss availability and, and plan performance to jumping into um, a tax equity partner meeting, right? Where you're talking about flip points and whatnot is, uh, is, is definitely a challenge, right? There's no question about it. And I think, I think what we try to do, and I think that's why, right? I mean, Jack, being a jack of all trades and someone, somebody who's interested in knowing the bigger picture, I think is, um, is, 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 is what would, would do well for a particular asset manager, right? Um, um, but again, the market that we're in, challenging to find, right? Um, is extremely challenging to find. Um, and so um, and now we are in the situation where, I mean, we have, we have an accounting team and we have a performance team, right? And so there are people who kind of want to kind of change careers, right? And, and see, you know what? Yes, like Wayne mentioned, hey, you know what? I've been, I've been doing accounting for this particular asset, right? I mean, like, let me look at it from an overall perspective. I've been doing performance engineering for this particular aspect. Let me look at it from an overall perspective. And so uh, that has been definitely an area which uh, I think a lot of asset managers and owners are like trying to move into, right? Because it gives the asset management team that extra capability of, you know what, I can lean on another asset manager in case to help support certain technical aspects or certain commercial aspects or certain accounting aspects, right, from where, when, when the time comes. And uh, I mean, uh, sometimes, some, I'm sure Blaine has seen this, right? Sometimes you're just astonished by an accountant kind of coming in and talking about blade bearings and, and high-speed pinions, right? And so it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's great to see uh, that, uh, that level of passion on, on, like a CPA would just come and talk about Hey, blade bearings and roof plate and root place blackness and, and whatnot. Um, well, and they get to go visit the site and they're yeah, excited. Yeah. It's like, oh, I've been accounting the site for 10 years and now here it is. Here I am. Yeah. Look at this cool yeah. stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they really like they really like that. Yeah. Sorry, I, sure. uh, I just yeah, sure. I want to throw something in on I know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think no, no, you alluded to something about leaning on other asset managers. If you don't have fantastic teamwork amongst your asset managers, you're doomed. They need to be able to pass the ball back and forth, work together, uh, and that's that's hugely important. Yeah. Great, thanks thanks for that. MIC, we have around 15 minutes uh, left and, and plenty of, of questions, but before we dive into the, the, the questions, I already see a couple of them relating to the, the topic I wanna bring up, which is a, a spare parts management. I think um, it's probably been two years, you know, a mix of, of supply chain constraints plus a uh, corona, that has really uh, affected the way things are shipped around the world. And I imagine for asset managers that that has to be a huge uh, headache. Can you just expand a bit on, on what supply chain constraints mean now versus they did a couple of years ago and kind of with all these new tools and these lessons, how are asset managers trying to solve the, the supply chain or the spare parts management issue? Blaine, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. I think um, the, the broader picture of supply chain is probably well known to most people who are on the call. Um, certainly have shipping issues, um, in particularly in the Pacific, you know, Port of Long Beach. I heard I heard earlier this week that the backlog's gotten down to 40 ships where it had been up to 120, so I think that's good news. Uh, but these, even then, you've got trucking constraints. 
Um, and you still have variability around COVID in, in China, right? I think recently they shut down segments, at least, of their country again. Uh, so, you know, it used to, the supply chain used to be uh, relatively understood. I don't, I wouldn't say it was easy, but you said, okay, here's my um, mean time between failure and here's my lead time. I'm going to figure out my uh, stocking levels before I need to go out and purchase. Uh, and But today it's like, okay, the, um, the lead times are low the dice. And so we all got pretty spoiled, even in our personal lives with, oh, look at that. And I'm going to order that on, you know, my phone and it'll be here two days or even tomorrow or in some really urban areas within an hour or two. Um, you know, spare parts for power plants were never that way, but we did have, um, we, I think we got pretty spoiled with a very reliable uh, supply chain, very reliable lead times. We just don't have that now. And then you, you really need to reevaluate. Well, what, what are my stocking levels going to be? What are my, what carrying costs am I going to assume? And then if I've got a supplier of some sort, if I've got a contract with somebody to do services, uh, you know, they have an easy force majeure. Right. If they before it used to be, hey, you have a supply chain issue that hits your availability. I get LDs. Now they say, yeah, sorry, uh, first for sure. And I'm not on the hook. So it pushes the, the risk back onto the owner in those scenarios. So it's a big challenge. And I don't know if there's a clear answer to the solution. True. Um, agreed as well. Right. Um, there is no clear answer to the solution. Um, I think the only thing that you probably can do is. Um, make sure that you, I talk about risk mitigation, right? I think that's, that's the key aspect, right? I mean, um, every year you have the opportunity to potentially buy spares, then you do, you do that, right? I mean, you for a fact do that. And even then, I mean, you're, you're, you're probably in the, you'll probably be in the situation where, um, you are, you don't have that particular type, right? Or, you potentially have an equipment that's burned down due to catastrophic, I mean, maybe a catastrophic failure where you have to replace every, you have to replace the entire inverter and that equipment, right? And so you run, you run that risk, right? And at that point in time, you have uh, anywhere from four to 16 week wait time, right? On equipment potentially, right? Um, uh, I mean, my suggestion, I would say, is something where I think we continue to work collaborative collaboratively right as a as uh, as the entire um, renewables um, team right um, and when I say it's a collaboration between owners between asset managers between OM providers and see what we can do right to help uh, best position ourselves right from that standpoint um, because <clears throat> some owner may have a, a, a spare some OM provider may have a spare that you could potentially use and so kind of having that that strategy has, has in, in certain situations like this, and this is pre-COVID, pre all these logistical situations that we've had, uh, where we've had, where we've had success from that standpoint, right? Where we've been able to kind of move parts from like one of our locations to another location, uh, not just because we've had the spare, but some of our own providers or some of the other owners have had spares, right? Um, I think I think that's definitely an aspect which I think everybody needs to kind of dig deeper into. Obviously, there are constraints and limitations to that idea. But um, <clears throat> I mean, in this situation, I don't think that there, there comes a better solution, right, from, from that standpoint. Um, I'd say, again, definitely think, well, <clears throat> another aspect which I feel is probably worth thinking about is looking at uh, what other solutions or what other equipment can go in place of whatever you're using there currently or whatever is failed, right? So being able to re-engineer parts is, uh, is is a key aspect that I think we continue to look at, right? Um, yes, I mean, you're still subject to all the uh, shipping constraints per se, but um, at least you're starting to think about it as a solution set. And um, obsolescence, right? I think will is, uh, is a topic which has hampered the solar industry, I would say the most at this point in time. Um, and so 
<clears throat> trying to find those um, replacement equipment, right? I mean, it's something that you start off doing well in advance, right? Uh, to kind of minimize uh, this negative impact. I mean, did I did I imagine that that solution was 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 for a shipping or a supply chain constraint situation? No, right? The answer is a simple no. But again, it's a solution that I think we are all kind of trying to have to live with, and um, or it's a, it's a problem that we're all having to live with, and hence. Uh, trying to find a solution towards that, I think, is uh, probably the best way that I think we can try to mitigate this. But it's it's hard. <clears throat> it's a hard market out there. Uh, it's it's hard to get parts, um, and everybody is having the same constraint, right? At this point in time. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for the answer uh, to the two of you. In in the last minutes we have left, I think we can try to do some you know rapid fire answering of of some questions from the audience because there's there are plenty. Um, the first one that I would ask, uh, this goes back to digitalization and, and having too many data points. Um, what is the one main challenge um, to, to address for successful data collection? I think, Anand, what is interesting is you already mentioned, you know, identifying the KPIs for investors or owners, et cetera, and focusing on those. But I'm curious, is there is there anything else? How would you summarize this, this problem? Um, <clears throat> I would say try to make sure the data quality is good, right? Because once you have your data quality good, I think you can pretty easily identify or calculate some of those key metrics. I mean, like I said, performance index, resource variance. I mean, you're, you're primarily looking at your energy and you're primarily looking at your resource, right? And so as long as like these two aspects are uh, are are accurate to the best extent possible and uh, the data is valid, I think you'll be you'll be fine 90% of your of the time. Yeah, I would, uh, yeah, I would uh, um, pick up on what Anand said earlier. I would start start with the end in mind. Right, you're you're not going to be able to go forward with your 200,000 points from a plant and figure out the right ones. Start where, you know, what reports do you need? What uh, data do you need to give to investors, senior manager, who, whomever, and then work your way backwards and ensure those data points work from the transducer in the field all the way through to the report. I can't I can't think of any other way to do it. You need to start with the end in mind. Okay, great. Um, the next question, also on digitalization in, in a different way. I think this is you know classic trendy topic. Um, to optimize the cleaning of, of solar panels, is it popular to apply fully autom like automatic uh, cleaning solutions or are we still depending on, on manual labor? And this is referring to in, in newly built farms. I'm curious to hear from both of your sides. Uh, in, in your fleet, do you normally you know do truck rolls or are you starting to go more into digital solutions? Ben, you want me to go first? Yeah. Um, yes, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's we don't we do not have fully autonomous solutions um, at this point. I mean, where it's part of capex right now. Um, that's that's not what we're looking at. And just given again specifically in the U.S. market, we're not we don't have extreme high amounts of soiling unless you are near certain unless you are in a in a location which which requires that, right? I mean, um, again. Uh, so a lot of it is seasonal, right? Um, unless you have soiling occurring all year long, I think that's when I think that that becomes uh, more of a viable solution. Uh, but for the most part, it's you evaluating, you doing a cost benefit analysis, and you guessing whether you're going to get rain or not, right? Uh, more often than not, I'd say that's probably the best solution that you have right now um, here, especially in the U.S. for now. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think that the it's it's almost a geotech question is, you know, how quickly does the soiling build up and then does it continue to accumulate? Uh there are some different soil types where, you know, within a day or two you've built up to the soiling layer that'll stay there for months. And so uh any cleaning only buys you two days worth of improved performance and it doesn't pay for itself. So it's almost a site by site determination and then depending on what the soiling is and what type is going to, it's going to change what you clean with. So I, it's too, it's too uh, nuanced of a thing to do. It, it has to be a side by side analysis. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Another example of how, you know, O&M is starting to, to connect more and more with asset management. And I think that's a, a good last question. Uh, the, the following question I'll say from our, from our audience, which relates exactly to that. It, it asks, it's basically saying, um, it seems that asset management is starting to merge with O&M more and more. Can we expect this trend to continue? If so, how will O&M KPIs change to better benefit the asset managers? Ben, you want to go first? Yeah, um, you know, I've done both in my career and currently I do both. We uh, we had a, a change uh, 
several months ago where uh, we merged the two. We still have separate roles. Um, it, it, they're different disciplines. They, there's heavy overlap. So, you know, I don't know what the best answer is in that regard. I think uh, the better folks from the two disciplines understand the other's role, the more they can work together. And it almost doesn't become an org chart issue. It, beca it, bec it becomes um, even a knowledge issue. I've started to invite um, the lead person in my region for O&M to my interviews for asset managers. And the first one he, he sat through, which was that list of questions I showed at the beginning, he, his eyes were huge. It's like, wow, I didn't realize you guys were dealing with, you know, they, they just see it through their lens. And I think yeah. that's, it's endemic to uh, every role, right? The accounting thing, folks think, well, the asset managers, they're just there processing bills. And the engineers are like, well, we're just talking about the widgets. And the O&M is like, well, we're just talking about the boots on the ground. And the asset managers got five balls in the air. I'm mixing my metaphors. I apologize. It's terrible. Um, but I, I, I think that um, to me, it boils down to teamwork. However you do your org chart is not as relevant as the understanding of one person's role to the other. Yeah, agreed. Um, there is a lot of like merging, right? To some extent, um, uh, it drives the right value add. Right, definitely will drive the right value, which is increased generation, right? Increased availability, increased performance, right? And what we're trying to do is trying to enforce to our asset managers that yes, although availability is your primary thing that you can potentially manage, at the same time, we are looking at it from a financial perspective where revenue optimization is key, where maximizing revenue is of paramount importance and adding value to the project is of paramount importance. And so, um, tuning our metrics such that both those are are twined, I think is the best way for us to manage it, I would say at this point in time. Um, but yeah, driving those certain values, driving certain decisions, I think it basically intertwines um, asset management and, and O&M for the most part. Great, great. I think that's a, a good uh, question to, to conclude with. Uh, of course, I, I think that's a, a classic question that uh, in our conference, the Asset Management uh, North America Conference, everyone discusses, you know, what is the 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 crossroads between O&M and Asset Management and how does this relationship uh, shape? So once again, I'd like to thank you, uh, Anand and Blaine, very much for, for this last hour. Very informative, definitely. A reminder to the attendees that are still watching that if you're interested in joining us in, in Oakland this 6th and 7th of October, you still have a chance of getting a 10% discount using the webinar-10 code. For all the attendees that we did not have time to, to answer your questions, I'm sorry, we had plenty of questions. And you know you can always stay tuned for future webinars. We try to discuss these types of topics all the time. And if you join the conference and you corner Anand or Blaine, I'm sure they'd love to answer all of your questions if you're polite about it. And that's, that's all from my side, uh, gentlemen. I, again, I'd like to thank you and thank our, our audience for staying with us. I wish everyone a happy rest of the day. Yeah, thank you, Alfonso. Yeah, thank you, Sol Plaza. And looking forward to seeing a lot of people in person uh, on in, in Oakland for sure. Great, great. Take care, guys. Thanks thank so much. You.